Uh, hello, everybody. It's the end of the day. Everybody's tired, ready for the after party. Uh, so before we go there, stay just a little bit with us. And we are going to talk about satellite image analysis and a little bit about deep neural networks, too. So first of all, uh, why uh, satellite images on Facebook? Uh, it turns out if you're using your Facebook app, very often you, you see that we show the map in the background. You can do it for the events. You can do it when you sell something in the marketplace. Uh, this map uh, nowadays comes from the project called OpenStreetMap that was men mentioned here uh, several times be before. And what we need at Facebook, we need a high-quality renderable map pretty much everywhere in the world. There are a lot of interesting uh, work uh, that could be done with OpenStreetMap. For those of you who do not know what this is, like Wikipedia of maps, so everybody can edit it. So one very interesting part of work that I'm not going to talk about today is that people can vandalize it. So you, we need to detect vandalism and remove it from there. But this is one part of work that our team does. The uh, second part of, our, uh, of uh, work is just to be able that for all the places in the world that we need, the map is complete or close to complete. So how do we do that? Uh, first of all, a quick analysis. Uh, what's the completeness, completeness status of OpenStreetMap? Uh, here on this plot, we did some samples and checks. Blue means the uh, map is basically good, more than 80% complete, and we mostly analyze the roads. Red, that means that it's below, like close to, from zero to 20% of the map that exists there on the ground. So you can see the large area of the world, of the world when the map could be dramatically improved. Uh, how do we do it from our side? So there are several ways of editing the map. What we figure out, there is a lot of tools, uh, a lot of help that could be used from the machine learning tools. So today, this is basically our pipeline of improving the map. So today, I'm going to talk about this part. We start with the high resolution uh, satellite images. It's about 50 centimeters per pixel of the images that we work with. We use machine learning to do the road prediction. Then we post process it in some, some kind of vector roads, vector representation. Merge with OpenStreetMap data, and then use a lot of manual process and verification that I'm not going to talk about that. So this presentation, we focus on this, on the scientific part of the, of the map editing. Uh, fundamentally, if you don't know much about deep neural networks, how it works, this is a basic thing that uh, in the deep part of our system. So we take this high, uh, very high resolution satellite image. It's about two petabytes of data to cover the whole world. We apply the deep neural network, network model, and in the end, we get per pixel probability. And again, each pixel is about 50 centimeters, like this size. A per pixel probability, whether it's a road and sometimes a building. So that's what we predict. So we start there. Uh, and uh, the rest of it is post-processing. But you can see this is already the first approximation of the map. What is a road, though? Like, how do we come, come up with the training data? Turns out the different parts of the world the roads could, could look completely different, and they also could be obscured by the um, clouds. There could be issues with low resolution. And the question is, what, what road is? It's very hard for us to train the models on this data. So we start as a regular machine learning approach. We just take a lot of training data. And if somebody is interested in the details, we sponsored the competition called Deep Globe uh, several years ago. And there we have samples of the training data downloadable there. So one part is literally people can sit there and draw pixel by pixel as the training data for the roads. Nowadays, we use something more advanced. We can train directly from the OpenStreetMap data using the existing roads as labeled. Uh, and pretty much this is what we get as the output of the mask. Again, the black in this particular image means the high probability that this particular pixel is a road. White is a low probability. So that's how we start. But it's still a raster data. It's per pixel. It's not a map. So how do we go from there? And it has a lot of noise. So at first, there's a lot of post-processing. We take this result. We do the threshold. We extract the center line. And arrive to basically some sort of graph, very noisy graph right there. Uh, then we trim and connect the results and use a lot of graph techniques to make sure the graph is consistent. Then we drop the uh, road islands, and this is basically our internal representation of the map of the area. Uh, let's take a look closer about a couple of results. So this was, again, we started with a satellite image, 
And this was our model produced. So those are all the rows, like the assumed rows in the area. This is the same model. Probably the biggest difference uh, to the previous approaches that we uh, made is we trained the single global model that works for the whole world. Basically, the model kind of figure out the road is something like long and narrow and with the straight edges. Here on this example, there's interesting um, false positive. Sometimes in the dry areas, the dry riverbeds look like roads. And it's very hard even for humans to distinguish that. This is another image coming from Nigeria. You can see that, again, the definition of roads is very different now. Now we have to go through a lot of vegetation, through a lot of tracks. I think that's a pretty good result. And finally, this is Boston. This is where our team is located. Uh, again, you can see that in the urban environment, the prediction uh, model works very well. But the question is, we don't need those roads there. Those roads are already mapped. They already exist in the open street map. So our last step that we do, so we take all our roads, we vectorize them, and then throw away. So that was how OpenStreetMap looked before we add our roads. And this is how it looks when we take our roads, vectorize them, and throw away everything that already exists there. And of course, there are a lot of post-processing, like how to merge those things together to make sure that they do not overlap. So we took all this work, and we recently released something called the Rapid Editor. For those of you who are familiar with OpenStreetMap, ID Editor is one of the main ways to, to edit it. And we edit our machine learning functionality on top of this editor. So basically, this is how the, and I, yeah, this is how the editing process look like. So magenta here is the roads that are not yet on the map, but you can add them, click them, and, and add it to the map. It becomes much faster. The interesting part, though, is Microsoft at the same time was also working along the same line, trying to generate and auto-detect a lot of building footprint, footprints. And they recently released about 125 million footprints of the data for the whole United States. Those are unmapped buildings here in the United States. So we can plug in into their data set, and you can use exactly the same technique for editing and uh, adding the buildings directly to the, to the map right there. So we hope, for, for many years, basically, we were struggling trying to figure out what is the right balance between what machine can do and what human can do to edit the maps. And most likely, this is our best balanced approach, where a machine detects and suggests the data, and the human actually validate, choose what, what, what to use or not to use. By the way, in this particular editing, if you, all those data just suggested, right? They're not automatically added to the, to, to the map. Uh, we can use switching the gear a little bit. We can use very similar techniques to estimate a human population in the world, the distribution of the human population. Because in many areas, we know only the aggregate numbers where people live. But we don't know where they live exactly. Turns out, and now let's look a little bit on the building data here. You can train a very similar model to detect just rooftops of, rooftops of the houses. And again, we could go with a similar segmentation model, working on pixel by pixel basis. But for this particular approach, uh, it turns out we don't need 50 centimeter resolution. Um, we work in about 30 meter resolution for the house detection. So it was much simpler to use a little bit different approach to work with the patches of the images, about 64 by 64 pixels, 30 by 30 meters, and classify, use something like classic uh, classification techniques based on top of deep neural networks right there. With that, we managed to compute the probably the highest resolution population density map existing in the world. And we recently released that. It's called a uh, high resolution settlement data set. And that's how basically it works. We start with the, again, high resolution image. We first use some basic classifier to throw away the areas where few people don't live for sure. Then we detect each building in this particular area. And finally, so we detect the houses, but how many people live there? Uh, here we work very closely with CSIN, Institute of Earth Sciences here in New York, who have a lot of aggregate numbers, census data uh, coming from the governments. And we can basically take this data and uh, distribute them proportionally to those houses that we detect. Again, this is an open source data set. You can go and play with it yourself. Right now it's available to download right there. 
So finally, uh, um, we used our tools to map parts of the world. And this video summarizes our attempts, uh, <laughs> attempts, our <laughs> final attempt, uh, to map Thailand. So it took us about 18 months for our mapping team to do that. We did it jointly with OpenStreetMap community, and that's how it worked. In fact, uh, when we were done with Thailand, uh, last 17 months, our team was mapping Indonesia and just completed it last week. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have such a nice video to show the progress there. Uh, so that's pretty much it. This summarizes uh, my presentation. And one thing that we learned again, that there's a subtle balance between what machines can do and what humans, where the human judgment is required. And I think in this, in this project, we figure out what's the right balance there. Um, before I start answering questions, let me ask, answer the first question, which is no, absolutely no personal data was used to generate this result. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your attention.